reporter at ABC7 Chicago. Uh, and I'm so excited to be here with you for this very special day as we are the beginning of the nationally designated recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month. It is a very special time. And we thought that we would take this opportunity uh, to talk about something that I feel like, um, you know, it's it sort of, uh, it can be confusing, can be really interesting as well, and is absolutely very important, but to talk about terminology, specifically the words that we use to identify ourselves, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, something else, which terms do you use to identify with yourself and why? And what do we know about the origins of these terms? Now, Chicago enjoys an incredibly diverse mix of Latino communities, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Central American, Dominican, Cuban, South American. I feel like the whole world is represented here, right? <laughs> Especially the whole, the whole Latin world. And then you have some that identify as Spanish, but were born here in Chicago. So today we're bringing together representatives from two of Chicago's largest groups, different professions, different generations as well, to hear from them about the terminology and what it means to each of them. And before we let them go, we want to hear about how their work also has been managing through the pandemic because it has impacted every facet of life. And because we all know that black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, making disparities in healthcare glaringly clear, as well as other inequities that we deal with every day. The Latino community has been out there joining in protests for racial justice since the killing of George Floyd in May, and there is still a strong push to make sure that everyone completes the census and gets out and votes. So these forums have given ABC7 a platform, a platform to have conversations that are unscripted, that are unedited, uh, and to explore topics that are really important to specific communities in our city and, and our country. And despite our racial and cultural differences, we all believe in social justice and racial equity for all people who are underrepresented, for all marginalized groups. And we can each take responsibility for this fight and moving our city forward together. So for our viewers on Facebook, if you submitted a question beforehand, we may be able to present one or two if time allows. But I want to get right to introducing our guests right now. So let's start here. We have Dr. Rosita Lopez. Thank you so much for joining us. Professor Emerita of Educational Administration and Leadership in Northern Illinois University. Dr. Rosita Lopez delivered the first graduate ethics course for educational leadership and school business students at Northern Illinois University School of Education. She's presented at numerous conferences, including Umea University in Sweden, where she shared her research on ethics at their ethical leadership conference. She served on the board of Casa Central, one of the largest Hispanic serving nonprofit organizations in the United States for over 20 years and 10 of them as chairperson. She also organized uh, she serves as chairperson of the Northeastern University El Centro Board in Chicago and has for over 18 years. Dr. Lopez has authored numerous publications and chapters on education and leadership and remains an associate with Sauder Betanzis and Associates, an innovative think tank, diversity development and speakers organization. She conducts seminars and studies for clients ranging from nonprofit educational institutions, state and federal agencies, and corporations too. Welcome and thank you for being here. Kenny Martino Casio is joining us as well, a senior vice president of community in, uh, integration at Aunt Martha's Health and Wellness. Uh, Martino Casio was born in Brooklyn, New York, and was raised in Puerto Rico. He came to Chicago at age 18 to resume his higher education and receive his bachelor in arts special education degree from Northern Illinois University in 1987 and a Master of Science in Health and Services Administration in 1999. He's worked in the area of human services, talking about substance abuse, mental health, domestic violence, child welfare as well for over 32 years and has dedicated his career to working toward the professional, social, economic and educational advancement of minorities, especially Latinos and the LGBTQ community. He served as president of the DuPage Hispanic Task Force, co-chair of the Latino Consortium, member of the Illinois Latino Agenda, the Latino Youth Action Coalition, and in the Cook County President's Latino Advisory. For the last uh, 10 years as a board member of the Association of Latinos and Latinas Moving Action, Motivating Action rather, he fights for the equal rights of the Latino LGBT community and Kenny now serves as senior vice president of community integration at Aunt Martha's Health and Wellness. 
Jorge Valdivia is a Chicago native. He grew up in La Vita, a, a Mexican-American enclave on the city's southwest side. Valdivia is an arts and media consultant working with organizations like the National Me uh, Museum of Mexican Art, serving as lead curator for the Sor Juana Festival, celebrating the artistic accomplishments of Mexican women. This is the only festival of its kind in the country. Jorge is also a consultant and co-curator of the Chicago Latino Theater Alliance, helping to make Destinos Fest one of the most reputable Latinx theater festivals in the country. In 2002, Valdivia uh, founded Homo Frequencia, the country's first Spanish language radio program to focus on LGBT issues. For uh, two years later, he and the show producers organized the first queer prom in Chicago, creating a critical safe space for young people who have been routinely ostracized from a traditional high school dance. Queer Prom continues as an annual event at the National Museum of Mexican Art, empowering a new generation of LGBTQ youth. And in 2009, Jorge was honored by the Mayor's Commission on Human Relations and inducted into Chicago's Gay and Lesbian Hall of Fame for his work with the Latinx LGBTQ youth and bringing visibility to the Latino LGBTQ community through media and arts. Valdivia has also served on the boards and councils of several organizations that reflect his passion for Latino and LGBTQ issues and the arts. And Lucy Angel, founder of Loose Ends and co-founder of Grocery Run Club. She's a first generation Mexican-American born and raised Chicagoan from La Vieta. Loose Ends is a Chicago-based cultural programming and event production agency focused on connecting people and brands through thoughtfully curated experience. The company was founded in 2018 and past clients include Red Bull, Soho House, Pitchfork, Pilot Light, and the Hoxton. Given the current status, of course, of events and safety, she's been able to pivot and aid her community during this time through the Grocery Run Club. It's a community-driven initiative that partners with organizations to supply fresh produce and everyday essentials to underserved neighborhoods in Chicago. That initiative was started in July of 2020 in an effort to give back and aid black and brown communities that were being so disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and civil unrest. And currently GRC serves 250 families a week through neighborhoods wow. like Gage Park, La Vieta, Austin, North Lawndale, and Bronzeville. Boy, thank you all so much for joining me. I, this is, I'm telling you the accolades, I feel like I should have a piece of parchment that goes all the way across like all the whole city across Lake Michigan into Michigan. So guys, thank you so much for taking the time and, and for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you for having us. And I just want to commend you for getting through all those bios, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's okay. Yeah, now we now we get the chance to talk, and that's that's the really fun part. So, um, so we're talking about something that is that we were talking before. This is a really interesting subject, and it can be confusing, but it's also super important in terms of how we all identify, right? So, let's start with this question of how do you identify in terms of Hispanic, Latino, Latina. Latinx, something else. So I'll go around to each of you and ask you, you know, how you identify and why, and then we can kind of talk about why that's meaningful and, and how important it is. So let's start with Dr. Lopez. Again, thank you for being here. And let's talk about identity. Yeah, this is a really important conversation to be having and one that we've been having for over 25 years. So it started a long time ago. And I remember sitting, not only talking about how Latinos, Hispanic, Latinx, Latino uh, identify, but also African-Americans who don't wanna be, you know, uh, identified as black or this or that, or African-American, they want to, so it's a controversial conversation, right? So it, it goes on a lot of different uh, spectrums, but in at the, at the very onset, I always say I'm a Puerto Rican, right? But then when you go into the academy, it's like, no, but you know, you have to say what uh, you're Hispanic, say you're Hispanic. In fact, say you're Hispanic American and that'll take care of everything. So I'm probably the oldest one on this panel because you guys look pretty young. And so I've been around <laughs> and, and those were difficult times. And, and so 
Uh, then I, I totally identify as a Latina, but then um, listened a little bit more and heard about Latino. So that's Lati with, um, what is it? The an, the yeah, at, yeah. the at, la roba, right? La roba. And in arroba, I went back to look at it. It really comes back from the Arabic word, which means uh, includes both males and females. So, so we had Latino, and, and I really like the Latinx because it includes so much. It's so much, you know, more diverse. But if you ask me what I identify as, Latina. That's what I, you know, Latina, Puerto Ricana. And, and sometimes I'll get asked, but do you mean Latina American? And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know what? I mean Latina, okay? It, it encompasses so much, so ja. So that's what, that's what I think. And, and, um, and that's kind of been my own uh, journey with this whole how I, how I identify. And let's not even begin to talk about how, if I identify as white, which is a race issue, not connected to you know whether I identify as Latina or not. And so that is, and I've always said, no, I'm totally brown. Don't even go there. But um, <laughs> so that's, I'll just, I'll hand it over to one of my very, very scholarly people on this <laughs> panel. Well, let, let's move it on uh, over to Jorge because uh, when, when, uh, when Dr. Lopez was talking about Latinx, I saw a lot, a big, a big uh, kind of head nod. So Jorge, tell me about how do you identify here? I identify, I, I identify as Mexican, Latinx, uh, Latino individually. And I think it, it's very important for me to, to say that um, it does depend on the setting because uh, personally, I have no problem identifying as Mexican or Latino because I do identify as a cisgender male, right? But if I'm in a group setting, I have no problem identifying as Latinx because I think that uh, is a very safe word that is inclusive of people who might not fall within the gender spectrum that we are, norm are normally used to, right? Um, and so because of the fact that the transgender and the non-binary community have been so outspoken about being included as part of the narrative, I think it's also very important for us to acknowledge that and so whenever I'm in group settings, you know, I'm, I'm totally comfortable. And I do use the term Latinx as well. How about you, Lucy? I'm definitely with Jorge on this one. I feel like I use all three. Um, I first identify as a Mexican-American. Um, I think for me, identifying as Mexican was always so for, at the forefront for me growing up in Little Village. I've just felt like everyone was Mexican. and in Little Village and it took until going to high school and being more open to my setting to realize that there, were, there was such a spectrum. And I think after that, I started to identify as Latina. Um, and then now as, as the word continues to evolve, I feel like depending on the setting, I, I switch between Latina and Latinx. Um, and I think that it's such a great conversation to have with so many people to know where they stand. I know a lot of folks that identify as Latinx and a lot of people that just identify as Latino saying that the O means that it encompasses everything, which I'm sure is also another controversial thing of, of language. Um, and so, yeah, I stick to Mexican-American, Latina, and Latinx. Gotcha. And Kenny, how about you? So I actually first identify as Boricua, which stems from the uh, the name, the Taino name for, for Puerto Rico, which was Borinquen. Borinquen. Uh, I look like a Taino, uh, I have the facial features, I have a color skin. So that is my first sort of go-to. And within Boricua, of course, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican. Uh, but I too have, have grown to be very fond and very, um, just very cognizant of, of the weight of the term Latinx because of a word that Dr. Lopez uh, mentioned, which is inclusion. And it is really a term that helps me feel included and be a part of. And I'm actually not as young as Dr. Lopez thinks I am. I think it's just the filter, so the Zoom. But uh, I'm 56 years old, but I remember as a child thinking that Spanish language is not very inclusive by virtue of it being so gender specific and within being gender specific being very male dominant. And so 
when the Latinx sort of uh, revolution and the Latino evolved, I think, you know, this is a call of us for us to, to tell our own story, to have our own narrative and to be able to make sure that everyone is included. And so I, I, I gladly identify as Latinx as well. Yeah, um, just personally too, I, I start with Puerto Rican and then I kind of over time went to Latino. And now I, I agree with you, Kenny. I mean, I, and, and it kind of, I, I think that this, this term Latinx is, um, can be so important for inclusivity, right? That is, I think the, the biggest part about it for me. And, um, and, and I, I don't know, has, for you guys, do you feel like it's important for us as Latinx people or Latinos, Hispanics, do you feel like it's important for us to unite under a single term or do you think it's important to have, or, or is it a combination of both? Having a term that we can kind of all unite behind and then also within that having our own individual monikers as well. Dr. Lopez, let's start with you. Yeah, no, that's a really good uh, way. And you kind of painted a picture with your words it, it, you know, we are very diverse within our communities, even within a small island like Puerto Rico, that's diverse, even in the way we speak and the way we pronounce things in Mexico. I mean, diversity, diversity in throughout, right? Cuba, I could go on. Uh, the bottom line is though, when we use the word, when we use Latinx, we're all united and the, the diversity and the, the, I don't know, the specialness of each group, el sazón, the flavor, the, the certain, you know, just that culture piece, it doesn't go away because you use Latinx. So in a way it's like all of us holding hands around a huge circle um, with very focused and strong goals, but not, letting go of our own identities as you know where whatever we mm -hmm. believe in we're doing whatever we choose it doesn't take it away and i and i like that a lot so so yes uh totally feel very comfortable with that and agree with yeah. you on that and i can open it up to everyone else as well whatever your whatever your thoughts are well it's funny because i think when you were speaking what i thought of was that the language, language is powerful, right? And it, it can be used to divide. And I think if these are efforts that are being used, because, you know, especially Latinx is a very generational term too. It has come as a, it has evolved as a result of a need for us to make sure that we are including folks. If you don't want to use it, don't, but at least acknowledge the fact that there is an effort being made at making sure that we're including everyone people who don't identify with gender markers and gender and are non-binary and they're part of our, our social construct and they don't necessarily identify with Latino or Latina, but they're part of it. So how do we include them? And so if language is being designed or it, it's, it's evolving to help understand sort of those social phenomena, then we ought to acknowledge that at the very least. Yeah. The only thing that I want to add is, um, I, I've been in situations where it, it you know, Latinx can become uh, a very heated uh, debate, depending on, you know, the people in the room. And I always resort to um, two reasons why I think it's important for us to use and uh, get used to the term, because I don't see it going anywhere. I think that language is something that evolves over time, which is why you know, sometimes we'll see uh, reporters like Mark Rivera telling us about a new word that was introduced and then people will create memes around that word, right? And so um, the two reasons, going back to the two reasons, number one, whenever a group of Latinas are in a room, they'll be referred to as Latinas. And I think a lot of us have seen that meme circulate as an educational tune tool. The minute a man, a cisgender man walks into the room, that group of people become Latinos, right? Because of one person. And I think that privilege changes depending on who is in that shared space. It's very important for us to acknowledge that. Um, and so that's why, I, that's, a, that's the number one reason. The second reason is because not everyone falls within the gender, the gender spectrums that, uh, binary spectrum that we are used to, right? And so I have no problem myself as a cisgender man making room for somebody else using the term Latinx so that they feel welcome in the space. Mm -hmm. But the minute that I see uh, it become a hated debate between 
two or three cisgender men on social media attacking the use of this term, I back away because, you know, nobody is asking anyone to stop using a term that they identify with. It's just, uh, it's one of those situations, a yes and, that we're so, we were so used to using in college or, you know, in classroom settings where if you're going to disagree, maybe sometimes it's a yes and situation. And this is one. About you? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I think it's interesting thinking about privilege and, and where everyone falls in that because it usually is folks with privilege that have a problem with Latinx. Mm -hmm. um, people that, and it also thinking about it being as a generational thing, like I know that my parents do not use Latinx yet, but they accept the term. They're not identifying as Latinx, but they have accepted it as a new term. And so just thinking about how we're also educating folks on how to use that word, no, assuming that we are privileged in knowing about this word and knowing how to uh, verbalize what it means, but also how we can continue to educate people in our community that may have not, maybe don't fully understand this term yet, but so that they understand that it's just a way to include everybody. I think that that's something that um, we all have, have work to do in order to kind of push this word along. Yes, absolutely. And, and Jorge, I think your point is, is uh, a really um, important one to make and, and one that that's a very strong argument, right? For the use of the use of that word. Why would a group of, of women all together, one man comes in and then it changes the whole descriptor of, of that entire group. So that is very, that's a very strong argument. I think the other um, aspect of it too, a, a kind of a third point, just um, bridging off of yours is that, you know, we as a group uh, have a certain set of um, issues, both political and otherwise, that affect all of us differently than they affect, um, than they affect other groups. And so I think that being able to come together under, under a term um, can help us kind of guide policy decisions even, or, or, or guide uh, you know, goals for, for us. Um, and that can, be, that can be a powerful tool as well. Um, let me ask you guys this. Why do you think it is this generational thing? Why do you think it is, um, maybe an older generation might not want to be a, as accepting of it? Or is it just sort of a, la a lack of understanding or maybe not kind of laid out in, in the right way for, for them to grasp? Or is it something else? Yeah, Mark, I, I want to hop in on that one. Yeah, go for and it. Really just kind of jumping off of what Jorge says, which I, you know, and, and, and Lucy and Kenny as well. It, I think all of this really um, gets to the point, but in the past, these identifiers were used more to divide and to exclude and to, you know, identify in such a way, but they were also, if we, in such a way that causes division. Um, it, let's start with the census, right? That's where the term all of a sudden comes up. You know, if we look at the history of the census for a long time, and we still are not really included. You're either black or white, or it's like, what? You know, where do I exactly, exactly, Jorge, you, you said it. And so what we have gone is away from that. Older generations stick to that because again, that's been uh, culturally uh, socialized kind of behaviors that, you know, thank, goodness for, for the, the Latinx, the newer generation that says enough, enough division, let's include, let's not lose the, the diversity the, the, and the wonderful you know, pieces that we're gonna miss out because we identify in one way and who does that leave out, right? So, so I think that's one of the first things and that's hopping off of exactly what Jorge says privilege, money, and so on. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, part of that is also uh, within, you know, generations, if it doesn't affect you, if it doesn't have a, a direct impact on you, if you have already garnered what you needed to do, right, and, and, and attain what you set out to do, uh, a change in language is not going to do that for you necessarily. So you have a younger generation saying, but yeah, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't speak to me. It doesn't help 
define me and it doesn't help represent me and I want to take charge of that and I want to be able to change it. And that's part of the excitement about it, I think, that, that to have a younger generation say, we want to challenge old norms, including mm -hmm. those about oppression within language. Right. That, uh, as Jorge described, are, are you're couched on privilege. If it's male, then that's part of it also. Then we want to challenge that. And I think it's not something that everyone feels comfortable with. Challenges of that nature are not something that, uh, it's not something that everyone openly and, and gladly welcomes. But I think, um, listen, I'm, I'm 56. I, you know, in, in another generation, another set of new, uh, challenges will be presented to them and, and new language will have to then also um, rise from that and, and be formed to help define those things that they're that are being experienced. I just hey, want to hey. oh, go sorry. ahead, Jorge. No, no, go ahead. I just wanted to add something because I think some of the other arguments that I've heard have been around language and um, how it, by introducing the X and forcing people who are native Spanish speakers, how that in itself is a form um, can be seen as imperialistic colonial another sort of form of colonization of a language but i think that uh it's really important for us when wherever we're in that setting to have a conversation around um how this same movement around language and latinx uh these conversations uh around latinx and the use of it um while they're happening here in the US, there's another movement happening in Mexico and in Latin America and the bigger cities where a younger generation is using the letter E for the same reasons, right? So right now we're on a Zoom here on ABC. Somebody's probably on a Zoom in Mexico City having this very con same conversation around, you know, bienvenides, you know, ustedes. And so the use of the, we're seeing that. And so um, you know, again, I resort to the fact that no one's asking anyone to stop using the term they can identify with. All we're saying is that in certain settings, it's always nice to make someone feel welcome. So like the only other thing that I wanted to add kind of on the note of generational and how this is a younger generation that has kind of pushed forth is how beautiful it is that a younger generation feels so empowered to say, this word is not working for me anymore and I would like to adapt it into a way that that does work for me. Um, I think that that's the really incredible part about this generation that maybe does not resonate with the generation that came before us that maybe felt like they couldn't speak up that felt that they had to put their head down and continue to to fall in these norms and categories that were already set out for them. Um, but we don't have to do that and we feel empowered to go ahead and, and change change language and I think about um, the LGBTQ community and how their word has adapted over time to add more letters to add, to be more inclusive. And I feel like that's what's happening with, with Latinx and maybe it will merge with what's happening in other countries with the letter E. I do think about that because todos is another word that if you add the X, I, I personally don't even know how I would pronounce it with the X. And so then it turns into todes, which is also more inclusive. And so just thinking about what that language looks like for everyone so that we can all come together in a more universal way would be ideal. Um, but I think for now, we're kind of all figuring out on our on our own. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's ironic because what had mentioned that a lot of folks that are anti that movement claim it to be or have some roots or flavors or of imperialism and colonization and it's the younger people that are wanting this how more anti-imperialism do you want it to be it's like the exact opposite of that um so i just wanted to say that to mention that too. <laughs> yeah um when you think about i mean yeah this is just it just puts a um just the, hits the nail right on the head of, about language, right? It, it is in a constant state of flux, right? New words are, we're, we're constantly making, outside of this conversation, we're constantly making new vernacular, right? We're constantly making new words that, that, that are not, um, that people aren't, you know, politically charged over, right? This is, this is uh, something that is an effort, right? To, to be inclusive. And, and that's, um, that, is, that is so important. So um, when you think about the, the origins of some of these other descriptors 
are is it important to keep in mind when you're talking about like Hispanic, Latino, or something like that? When is it important to keep in mind the the origin of those words? Does that make an impact on whether you want to use them? That's a good point. About, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Rosa. Go ahead. Okay. So no, I went to a conference and and I used the word Hispanic and I was and this was I'm talking twenty plus years ago. I was in Texas. And, um, and I, I used the word Hispanic and they totally rejected it. They said, no, I'm not in a panic. Stop using that word. It has negative for, for them. It had a real negative tone. I was not aware of that. So I learned that day that that was something that was rejected. This was, as I said, a long time ago. Um, and, and so words have negative you know, negative meanings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just like an education, LEP, that means limited English proficient. And, and younger educators are saying, oh, no, 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 not limited, English language learners. So they're, you know, change that. But if you look at the reports that are going to, you know, uh, the states and all that, it still remains limited English. So there's a limitness to it. And, and so that's what I think um, and feel that Hispanic comes from, even though we speak Spanish, right? Or whatever, you know, and, and I never looked at it as negatively until I went to Texas, I stopped using it. I mean, that was my education in Texas, never did it again. <laughs> well, I mean, you, 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 that's the right, like, so our, we're moving way faster than sometimes our, our, uh, uh, our governments and, and you know, our, our, uh, uh, the people that are putting together these forms that are sent out, right? I mean, even f on the federal level, National Hispanic Heritage Month, right? That's how it's, that's how it is proclaimed, you know? So, um, so it is such a, it's so interesting. Uh, when you guys think about Latino, is there, is there anything that, uh, I think outside of the exclusivity, is there any, uh, uh, for non-binary and, and, and uh, other people like that, when we think about how that word is used, is that, is that problematic at all? The term Latino? Mm -hmm. No, I think, I think if anything, the term that, is, that can be problematic uh, is Hispanic for me, uh, just because it really doesn't, it's a term that connects this based on language, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that we um, are all Span come from Spanish-speaking countries, that's our origin. But it doesn't acknowledge or recognize the fact that we come in many different races, um, that we uh, have indigenous blood, that we have mm -hmm. African blood. And so I think that that to me is, is a term that can be problematic. And you know, while we're having this conversation, I also have to acknowledge the fact that some people are much more comfortable using that term. I know that in the Southwest, for instance, a lot of people identify with that term, but for me, that's a term that is problematic. And I think to your question, Marcus, when language, you know, and, and I think Dr. Lopez uh, hit it on the head with, with the term limited English proficiency, when there isn't something that defines that is defined, language will be created by those who have the power to do that. So when you have, when you sit in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a seat of privilege by virtue of power of authority, then you will create language for things that you don't understand. I didn't create Hispanic. I don't know that a lot of people that I identify as Latino did. Um, so, you know, and I don't, I, I never wanted to be thought of as having limited English proficiency. You know, for me, you know, learning a language is an ongoing process. But it does something not only for the person who has the power to create it, but in creating it, they also sort of marginalize folks who, who fall in that category, right? It serves to continue to, to be an oppressive tool more often than not. And so I go back to the fact that if younger people are saying, but we want to use it differently, then we ought to invite that. And we want to, we ought to support and, 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 and learn from that actually. And I do hope that this changes the that this change in language and and asking people in power to accommodate what we're requesting does change Hispanic Heritage Month into something that we're all very happy with because Hispanic Heritage Month and its origins 
are just someone, a president that decided to deem this and say, okay, you guys get a month and it's gonna be named Hispanic Heritage Month. I, I don't know that I consulted people of this community to see if that works for them. And so now we have something that, you know, we're all requesting, can it be Latinx Heritage Month? And how are we going to move forward in trying to change that and challenge that so that we feel more comfortable celebrating this month? Because I've seen a, a lot of a lot of verbiage going around of people crossing out the Hispanic and putting Latinx. And that's the power and kind of our responsibility moving forward to make sure that we're holding people that are in power accountable for, for updating these words. Absolutely. Well, guys, this has been such a great conversation about, about language. And I mean, seriously, it completely inspirational. Kenny, when you were talking about the, the power uh, that you have when you create language, <laughs> I mean, that is, that was, uh, it, it is really so important, inspirational, and, and we need to be talking about this more. So um, I want to transition into talking a little bit about how uh, COVID-19 has affected uh, our communities and how it's affected the work that all of you do. Um, because it's important to know that good work, number one, good work is still going on right now, right? Good work is going on now, despite and in spite of the issues that are happening and that, that have affected all of us. So. Um, let me just ask you, and uh, why don't we start with, with you, Kenny. Tell me about how COVID has affected your work. Uh, well, <laughs> has it ever. You know, I work in the space of health and wellness, and we serve over 100,000 folks throughout the state of Illinois. And so early, early on in, in, in the sort of in the, in the birth of the pandemic and, 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 and its sort of migrating here into the U.S., we were observing and looking and and beginning to uh, analyze how we were going to react to it. So it was early on that we uh, had a response team that was really dedicated to understanding how to best serve uh, uh, our patients and our, and our clients, but also keeping them and our staff safe, creating barriers and you know, social distancing and, and, and uh, PPE and, and masks and all of that. So at the very least, it really changed the way that we look at serving and providing care in, in, a, in a very different way, you know, creating new environments. We really uh, ramped up our technology and have been able to do more telehealth and telepsych and telebehavioral uh, services than ever before because they are really significantly needed. There's a whole lot of folks experiencing anxiety and depression as a result of what all of this uncertainty brings. Um, but as you said, you know, and, and, and being in the space of the federally qualified health center networks, we serve primarily poor people, and we serve a lot of folks that are um, from those communities of color, and our positivity rate in those communities is significantly higher than that of the rest. And uh, we want to continue serving and testing and, and caring for them, but part of that comes with a whole lot of education because folks of color have been misused by the healthcare system oftentimes, and we want to be cognizant of the fact that to, to consume healthcare, you have to trust healthcare. And that is part of the work that we have to do to make sure that they know where they're to be their best agent for health and wellness and how do we want to make sure that they come and get tested and continue using us and continue seeking and accessing the services that they need. So, uh, you know, we just procured two mobile units and we're doing testing now uh, at a more expansive rate. We do testing from all of our sites and um, there's a whole lot of folks that continue not needing to be tested once but on repeated occasions because of the work that they do and we've had you know partnerships with idph the illinois department of public health as well as with um, uh, other companies to really look at how to best increase and and um, make it accessible for everyone so it's a continuing effort and uh it's something that is it continues to to work well for us but um, it doesn't come with a whole lot of work and a whole lot of effort and um, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing and that we continue to do. Absolutely. And I, I, I think, you know, what you brought up about communities of color and that trust aspect, that is, that's such a huge part of, of you know, that, that's a definitely a part of this, the issue that we're having is that this idea of trusting our medical professionals, because there's a lot of history that, that needs to be overcome uh, in some cases. So. Um, thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, seriously, I mean, it, it's incredible. Um, 
and we need more people like all of you on this <laughs> on this board here to 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 make this to make this happen and and to uh, to keep this going. So, uh, Lucy, let me ask you. Uh, I know this has completely changed um, it changed your business model and and what you're doing, but tell me about how you have pivoted because this is really inspirational as well. Thank you. Um, obviously, the events industry is is at a pause right now. I think it will be for quite some time. The, the things that I love about gathering people are not happening anytime soon. And there are safe ways to gather, but I felt that it was more important to make sure that I was repivoting my priorities to make sure that I was showing up for my community. Um, and so I co-founded Grocery Run Club with my partner, Jorge. And what we are doing is essentially being a support system for organizations in communities that are already serving their constituents. Um, and so those are predominantly in black and brown areas of the city, like Little Village, like Gage Park, Austin, Bronzeville, um, North Lawndale and such. And so a lot of the organizations that are in these communities have had to pivot to just create a rapid response to what their communities need right now. And a lot of that is food. food. Um, there's a lot of food insecurity happening right now. After the civil unrest, there were there's a lot of stores. The one corner store that neighborhoods had is no longer there. And so there's lack of access for just everyday necessities, whether that's toilet paper or cleaning supplies. And I think that if you go around the city, you can still see that even on the north side that you can't get Lysol in certain places. So then when you think about communities that have already been underserved, having access to those things has just become even more difficult. Um, and so with Grocery Run Club, what we do is we partner with these organizations and we do grocery runs for them for whatever it is that they need, whether that's cleaning supplies, fresh produce. Um, and so it, it has been just such a, it, it's so shocking to see the need that's happening in our communities, especially in black and brown communities. Um, not only have we been disinvested in throughout, you know, the last decades, but no one is coming for us right now to to come and help save us and we all have to just take care of ourselves that that's what it feels like being out on the field and so it is people that are bringing mobile you know care units into the communities to make sure that communities are being tested it is people going to partner to make sure that folks have food um and so that's that's what we're that's my whole life has changed into this um now and it's it's so rewarding, obviously, but it just paints the picture and it shows that there is so much work to be done. Um, this is not something that we're gonna solve through our organization, but we're definitely hoping to be part of the long lasting solution to make sure that we're asking for resources, that we're creating resources for ourselves and that we're making sure that we show up for our community on the bad days, not just on when everything's nice and pretty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, that that's how my my whole business has changed. It's one business is on pause, another one starts. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, tell me, just what are the reactions from when you are when you guys deliver? I mean, I'm sure that there's got to be just so much gratitude out there. Yeah, I mean, people are so grateful that someone is showing up for them. I think um, the the big thing that I want to stress is the organizations that we're partnering with have been there for their community. And so this is just an extension of something that they're able to offer. So they already have, they know exactly what their community needs. Um, and so they're able to flip to us. I, I'd like to reference the Gage Park Latinx Council, given also the word, the verbiage, but we, we love them. And what they've been able to do, they mainly focus on arts programming, um, you know, getting resources to their community in terms of like filling out the census, getting them to vote. And they pivoted to make sure that they were distributing food during this time because that's what they heard their community needed. And so they were able to come to Grocery Run Club and say, here are the 10 items that our community is requesting because they're so in tune with what their community wants. And so we're able to flip it and get them exactly what they want. Um, and so when you get a box of produce that's all produce and non-perishables that you're actually going to use that are culturally affirming versus getting, you know, there's a lot of food pantries mm -hmm. that are doing incredible work, but unfortunately the box becomes a catch-all for mm -hmm. all of these random things that you're not sure if the community is actually going to use. And so if you're going to a Latino community, but you're giving them items that some some items, they might not even know what they are versus a box that has tomatoes, that has cilantro, that has peppers and tortillas and things like that. It just shows the community that you care 
and that you're listening to them and what their needs are. Um, and so I think because of that, it, it has been met with so much gratitude and it definitely keeps us going to make sure that we're showing up in the correct way and that we can continue to expand our reach. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned, you mentioned how the arts have, have pivoted. I want to ask you, Jorge, you know, how has this affected, affected what you do every day and the people that you work with? Yeah. So, um, you know, surprisingly, it's been business as usual and not. Um, so everything that we, uh, the work that I do, for instance, curating the Performing Arts Festival for the National Museum of Mexican Art, had, you know, that basically went on pause. But what we, for a moment, um, my brother died of COVID. And so I took a break uh, to grieve. And when I was ready, I came back and um, started, um, you know, got right back into work. And a lot of the uh, the performers that we had scheduled to perform, I reached out to them and we did interviews. We're now doing um, virtual events because the reality is that while uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic, we're also socially starved. And I think that a lot of us are looking for something to do, a way to connect. And so we have decided to continue offering programming. Um, if anything, I, I've, I've realized that it's more work because in some cases I find myself pre-recording the events and then I'm hosting the events live. So, you know, as opposed to just hosting and doing the event live, I, you know, I, I find myself doing two things. Um, and so there's a lot of work that goes, uh, that that is required behind the scenes, the scheduling, the pre-recording, and and um, and so we had to learn really quickly um, and make a lot of investments here at the museum so that it could be done well. And uh, I'm very happy with uh, the response because, to be honest, you know, um, we really didn't know what to expect. But you know, once we we did a Selena tribute a few months ago. We did a Juan Gabriel tribute uh, just recently. And, um, and another thing that we're not talking about right now, but is, I feel is very important to mention is there's a lot of artists out there that, are, that need these opportunities. And so I'm very happy that we're able to provide working opportunities for artists because um, you know, there, are, there are hardly any opportunities right now. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, it's just really nice to see that people, um, still want to come together even though it's virtual um, and uh, we're going to continue to offer virtual programming programming up until next year as well because you know the the near future is still uncertain we're on, you know a lot of us are we, we still don't know when that uh, vaccine is going to come out and uh, so there are a lot of a lot more questions than answers and so we're planning accordingly yeah, absolutely. Planning for that uncertainty. And Jorge, just know I'm I'm so sorry about your brother and thank you for for being here and talking about it and 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 talking about, you know, the importance of being aware of this illness and how serious it is. Um, let me ask you this too. I, I think you you touched on it as well, the the social aspect of mm -hmm of the situation that we're all in, right? We're, we're doing it right now. <laughs> I mean, we're all in our pods, right? We're all in our own little homes or wherever we are. And um, you're right. I, I, I know that I feel starved for that social interaction outside of work or outside of, you know, what I have to do every day. So do you have any strategies that you, that you've been able to, to, implement to, to try and bring people together or things that people should keep in mind? Yeah, you know, so um, I try as as hard as possible to make it seem like um, it's still uh, an opportunity for people people to come together and celebrate. So because at the end of the day, people just want to have a good time. And so with these events, what I've noticed is people will have get togethers. Mostly, uh, what I'm seeing is families um, that are you know will see people just like us, but it's a bunch of people in each little square. And it's really nice to see that people, that families are getting together and enjoying these events. And we'll take moments uh, to sort of check in with everyone and where they're joining us from. And one of the things that I've realized is that um, the museum has such 
a large reach. We've got people, this has made me realize that um, the audience that we're serving now is much larger than the audience that we served before the pandemic. And that's because we've got people joining us from Mexico City, from Iowa City, from Des Moines, um, from different parts of the country and different parts of the world. We even had someone join from uh, Bolivia. Uh, you know, it was like really random places and, but they're joining us, you know, and, and uh, it's really nice to see um, that happen. And I think that, um, you know, they're drinking and, and, and they're, a lot of them are mirror casting, um, projecting what it is that we're, we're playing onto the television, they're mirror casting. And so um, I think that by continuing to offer programming, for offering those opportunities for them to get together and celebrate, I think th th that's a form of consistency that people need so that they can congregate socially, even though it's virtually. Dr. Lopez, how about you? Well, before saying anything, what a great panel. My gosh, I'm, I'm so inspired by all the things that they do. Um, I, For me, I had just come back from uh, helping build homes in Puerto Rico after the earthquakes. And so, and I had also been part of the, you know, hurricane, uh, you know, reconstruction, if you will, which is still not uh, even up to par. And when the, when the earthquakes hit, I was, I really came back sad, depressed and sort of, you know, what else can happen? And then COVID hit. And I don't know what happened, but part of me said, we, how much more can happen, <laughs> right? Never ask that question because more will come. And, but, but, I, but one of the things that I did, I, and my husband was so shocked, I started making masks by hand. I mean, I got a really good pattern and I don't sew. So all of this is by hand. <laughs> but I'm good at following instructions and I know how to, uh, you know, I, I, know how to, I know how to stitch. And I started stitching masks of uh, three layers with a filter inside. I mean, I was, and then I got into really cool looking masks, you know, the guy wants some for this and some for that. And I started making masks for uh, people in the community around Humble Park. Uh, we have a lot of elders that are served by Casa Central. And they serve not only the young, uh, the very young, the preschoolers, but they also serve um, elderly who used to come in to Casa Central and spend a day every day. This was our adult wellness, right? Well, now they're stuck in the house. And so one of the things I did was I started making masks, taking them over to Casa Central and having them give them out. And we also uh, provide housing for, at Casa Central, they provide housing for families that are disenfranchised. And I got to go back to what pretty much everybody said on the panel, Latinos were hit really hard. And people of color in general, uh, people lacking resources, poverty. Um, and so, you know, you add the piece, I don't trust the government, I don't trust anything. They just really huddled inside the lack of food and good fresh things that was really evident. So kudos to you, Lucy, on, on making that happen along with all these other great organizations. So my hands were getting tired and I decided I'm gonna call some people that sew. I'm like, can you help me? Sure, how many do you want me to make? I said, you know, 200, they go, I'll make 50. Okay, fine. <laughs> so I called somebody else. Yeah, they were like, don't push it lady. but. But you know what happened? Then they wanted to make more. And all of a sudden we were making masks and I was taking orders, all the money for people. All of this was free to people who didn't have resources. But then people who did have resources said, I heard about your mask. I wanna order some from my family. Well, all the funding went, any monies went to Casa Central. To con so they continue servicing and providing because Everything was at a standstill. It almost felt like what's going to happen now. But what it did was it lifted my spirits. It felt really good. I live in, you know, out of the city, but it felt really good. Uh, just every so often seeing somebody wearing a mask that I knew I had made by the stitching. And I'm doing them by hand. Other people did fancy ones with machines. But we got really good at it. And it, you know what it did? It lifted our spirits. We were doing something. 
Like I couldn't go out, build houses. Like we did, you know, we helped build these small homes during the earthquake, uh, collected monies to help do that, food, the whole thing. But making the masks, it just, all of us, you know, got together. So on September 24th, we're gonna have a gala. Of course it's drive-in. And one of the things that we did was all the ladies and all of the, and there were men too. I mean, it was like a, a community thing. They are going to our gala. It's a drive-in in your car and um, you get to watch a movie and you get to see Dolores Vuelta, say a few words. I mean, come on, this is historical. But all of them were gifted with um, an opportunity to go to a gala, thanking them for, you know, sewing and making other people safe. And it feels good because masks are still the best way to protect yourself, hands down, regardless of what anybody says until the vaccine gets here. And we're not gonna be the first ones to get it. I mean, let's also go there. We'll sometime in end of 2021, if we're lucky, right? But in the meantime, we can protect ourselves and be really smart. So that was my, um, my piece. And now I'm going around just letting people in the community know you've got to vote. If you wanna change things so that you don't find yourself being the last one that receives anything, if you're not part of that, you can't complain. We're the sleeping giant. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's another piece, but, but that's, that's my thing. I'm really honored to be here with you guys. You guys are great. Oh, well, we're so happy to have all of you talking about all of this. And I think you, you made a great point. When you feel like you can take action to take, take some semblance of control back, because it, it is so, it's so chaotic sometimes, but to, to be able to say, you know what, I am doing this for this end and, and actually taking that step is a powerful thing to do. And, and I feel like anybody can do that. So that, that's, yeah. that's phenomenal. And you've brought up a really good point, right? Voting and the census. Mm. Well, okay, we need to talk about the census briefly. We've only got a few minutes left, but let me just ask you, I mean, we, I, I, it's hard for me to understate or overstate, I should say, the importance of the census in terms of how it affects our community. So when you think about, if there's one thing you would say to somebody out there who hasn't filled it out yet, what would it be? Well, we tell that of all the patients and everyone with whom we interact is thank you for coming in. There's a census for make sure that you look at it and make sure that you are informed because yeah, I, you know, again, we are serving folks that are living in the margins and those are the ones more affected by being invisible. And we wanna make sure that they are, that we all are visible and that we're all counted. And uh, especially in an environment like this, that we are hit not only by COVID, but by a whole lot of social unrest that's really characterized by dividing and div divisiveness. And, and so we wanna make sure that we are present, involved and visible. And in order to do that, we have to be counted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, uh, it's really important to be counted because the, the reality is a lot of the issues that we are concerned as individually and collectively, um, you know, funding depends on the census. And so the census, the bottom line equals power, you know, and, um, and regardless of your, uh, your uh, citizenship status, that doesn't matter. And, you know, uh, it, it's important for you to fill it out. That's, you know, I keep saying that over and over again, because I think that some people have tried to instill fear in people who are undocumented but your citizenship status, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you fill it out and that your, your voice is heard and you're counted. Yeah, something that I say is, you know, acaba ya, do it, hurry up, you know, and I'll help you. I'll help you fill mm -hmm. it out if you feel uncomfortable and, and that sort of thing. And people say, yeah, you know what, you're right. And they actually start to do it. They go, it's not even hard. It was easier than I thought. And so, um, yeah, but, People are just afraid of anything that has to do with filling out a form, but you're right. It equals the bottom line. We need to help others to also do what needs to be done. Census and voting, really important. Definitely. Well, thank you all so much for your time today. I, can't, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it and how much we appreciate it at ABC7. This is such an important conversation. And, uh, uh, on all levels. <laughs> and I'm just grateful to have it with you. So thank you all so much for your time. 
Thank, Thank you, you for having us. It was us. wonderful. Thank Absolutely. You. All right. And that is it for our talent.